What's up, my comic comrades? Villains Month is officially in full swing here on Variant, so it's time we give you all the comic book history for one of Marvel's most notorious and sinister bads, Dr. Otto Octavius, otherwise known as Dr. Octopus. As the world knows, Alfred Molina will actually be reprising his role as the live-action Doc Ock in Spider-Man No Way Home this coming December, so this will get you prepped and ready for the character's return to the big screen. We also want to remind you all that Variant the Podcast is back with both the audio and video versions of the show. Tim and I have been talking everything from Marvel's What If series to our thoughts on Venom Let There Be Carnage, and the latest news coming out of the world of comics and geekdom. There's a great lineup slated for the podcast in October as well, including coverage of DC fandom, special guests, and exclusive content, including early reveals for Scott Snyder's new titles under Comixology Originals and his best jacket press imprint. So if you haven't already, jump over to our Variant the Podcast channel here on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. And speaking of Snyder's new books, we actually just posted an exclusive look at the first title from that slate, We Have Demons, Issue 1, right here on the main Variant channel. The episode features a breakdown of how the story begins, as well as creator insights and even a few spoilers from Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo themselves. Stuff you'll only see here on Variant, and believe me, you want to check it out because We Have Demons is freaking awesome so far. So if you haven't seen that episode yet, you definitely want to. You can check that episode out right here. I'll also add that the first issue for We Have Demons just released on Comixology and Kindle yesterday. So we'll throw a link for that in the description so you can grab a copy and read it for yourself. In fact, if you're an Amazon Prime, Comixology Unlimited, or Kindle Unlimited member, you can read it right now for free. So that's a plus. But now let's see why Doc Ock is one of Spider-Man's most popular villains. <laughs> Dr. Octopus was created by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. He made his first appearance in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 3 in July of 1963. He's also the third villain to appear in The Amazing Spider-Man comic series. Chameleon would appear in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 1, Vulture would appear in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 2, and in issue 3, we would see Dr. Octopus for the very first time. Doc Ock is regarded by longtime Spider-Man fanatics like me as one of Spider-Man's three arch enemies. Those three would be Green Goblin, Venom, and Dr. Octopus, the trinity of Spider-Man villains, if you will. Which says a lot as Spider-Man has one of the most vast and prominent rogues galleries in all of comic books, only to be rivaled by Batman's rogues gallery. Doc Ock is also the founder and leader of the original Sinister Six, which is the first supervillain team to ever face off against Spider-Man. But more on that later. Now it's time to take a look at Doc Ock's fictional origin. We are given Dr. Octopus's origin in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 3, but before Otto Octavius became Dr. Octopus, we learned about his childhood years later in the Spider-Man Otto Octavius Year 1 miniseries. It's in the miniseries we learn that Otto had a very troubled childhood growing up in an oppressive household. His mother was overprotective and his father didn't like that Otto always got picked on at school for being a nerd who just excelled in academics. Years later, as Otto got older, he would begin to excel in academia to the point where he got a scholarship for a college university. But shortly after this, his father died in a workplace accident, but even in Death, he always wanted a bit of his father's approval, so Otto applied himself even harder to his studies and research. Because of this, when he graduated, he immediately got work with an engineering firm and became a respected nuclear physicist. He also became an inventor and, you guessed it, soon created his most notable invention, a chest harness that had four mechanical arms attached to it. And with the addition of these four mechanical limbs, his colleagues gave him the nickname Dr. Octopus, because octopuses have eight limbs, and now so does he with his mechanical arms. But now with some backstory on Octavius's early years, let's see how he became Dr. Octopus in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 3. In the issue, we see Spider-Man defeat three criminals trying to steal a safe. After he does this, he says to himself, it's almost too easy. I've run out of enemies who can give me any real opposition. I'm too powerful for any foe. I almost wish for an opponent who would give me a run for my money. Well, Spider-Man, your wish is about to be granted, because on the next page, we are brought to a U.S. Atomic Research Center, where a man inside says, here comes Dr. Octopus. Another man asks, Dr. Octopus? Why do they call him that? The man replies, watch. You'll see in a minute. As we get a panel of Octavius putting on his mechanical arms, with the two men in the doorway saying, see, it's that especially designed contraption he wears, which enables him to perform his experiments behind the lead walls, which shield him from radiation. He's the only scientist permitted to wear it. He's the most brilliant atomic researcher in our country today. We then get panels of Doc Ock performing nuclear experiments with his artificial arms. Octavius then says to himself, my artificial extra arms permit me to work safely with volatile chemicals, which are far too dangerous to touch without protection. The others fear radiation, but I'm able to make it my servant. As the radiation levels start going going crazy due to his experiment ultimately causing his research lab to blow up. He's later rescued once the flames and smoke has cleared by two men in radiation suits saying, Dr. Octopus is still breathing. I hope we reached him in time. One of the men then says, even though he's alive, he's absorbed a great deal of radiation, poor guy. After doctors run some tests on him, they say the x-rays show a certain amount of brain damage. Another doctor says, we can't remove those artificial arms of his. The radiation has caused them to adhere to his body in some strange way. Days later, Octavius wakes up asking what he's doing there in the hospital, telling the nurse, let me up. I must return to my work. 
work, but they tell him, you've been very ill. You must stay in bed. You need to rest. The comic then tells us, but the brain of Dr. Octopus has been damaged by radiation and reacts in a bitter way. As we see Octavia say, they're jealous of me. They want to keep me from my work, but I'll show them I'm stronger than any of them. As he sits up, he sees the window is barred, saying they're trying to make me a prisoner. The fools. No one could hold Dr. Octopus against his will. No one. The comic continues to tell us, then suddenly, with just a suggestion of a thought, by Dr. Octopus, his artificial arms move as though they have a will of their own. With Octavia saying, I've got to break those bars. At which point, the arms do just that. With Octavia saying, I did it. My arms did it. Their strength is incalculable. They can do anything. Somehow, my artificial arms have almost become a part of me. They obey my every command. With such power and my brilliant mind, I am the supreme human being of Earth. Elsewhere at the Daily Bugle, Jameson tells Peter, I want pictures of the injured scientist, Dr. Octopus, but no one is allowed to enter the Bliss Private Hospital anymore. Long story short, Peter agrees to get Jameson his pictures. So when he goes to check out Dr. Octopus, as Spider-Man, mind you, he discovers Octavius has gone crazy, keeping several people prisoners as he works on his experiments. And I think you guys know where it goes from here. Spidey comes to the prisoner's rescue, coming into confrontation with Dr. Octopus for the first time before ultimately defeating and webbing him by the end of the issue. So there you have it, friends. That's how Otto Octavius became Dr. Octopus. So now let's move on to story arcs and publication history. Now, Dr. Octopus definitely has no shortage of great story arcs going up against the Web Slinger, and there's definitely no way I'm going to be able to cover all of them today. So we're just going to pick and choose some of the greatest hits, if you will. But I will say there's three main parts to Dr. Octopus's time in comics over the years. You have Dr. Octopus, who eventually becomes the founder and leader of the Sinister Six. Then you have Otto Octavius, who becomes the Superior Spider-Man, and then of course we have Superior Octopus. So we're going to touch a bit on his normal Dr. Octopus, as well as summarizing his time as Superior Spider-Man and Superior Octopus. With that said, let's get into it. After Dr. Dr. Octopus first appeared in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 3, we will not see him again until The Amazing Spider-Man issue 11, where the cover even says, featuring the long-awaited return of Dr. Octopus. This rolled over into The Amazing Spider-Man issue 12, where Octavius is back again, this time unmasking Spider-Man. But don't worry, a secret identity wasn't given away, everyone just thought Peter Parker was pretending to be Spider-Man to save his girlfriend, and not actually the real Spider-Man. Anyway, this all leads us to The Amazing Spider-Man Annual 1, the first appearance of the Sinister Six, which was created by none other than Dr. Octopus. The team can consisted of Vulture, Electro, Sandman, Kraven, Mysterio, and of course, Dr. Octopus. At the beginning of the Amazing Spider-Man Annual 1, we see Dr. Octopus escaping from prison, mentally controlling his mechanical arms to break him out. Once free from prison, Octavius calls a meeting with some of the deadliest Spider-Man villains, such as Kraven the Hunter, Mysterio, and Electro. They're also waiting for Vulture and Sandman. Anyway, Kraven ultimately says, Octavius has a great idea. Each of us almost defeated Spider-Man alone. Together, how could we fail? Once Vulture and Sandman show up, Octavius says, great, now we can start. Here's the plan. We learn that the plan is to have each villain fight Spider-Man at a specific place that will give them the upper hand. And after each fight, Spider-Man will become weaker and weaker until ultimately one of them takes him down. We actually go over this in great detail in our Origin of the Sinister Six episode. So if you want to know more about how the first confrontation with the Sinister Six went down, check out that video right here. Sometime after this in the Amazing Spider-Man issues 53 through 56, we got the Doc Ock win story. Basically, Dr. Octopus goes after Spider-Man once again, trying to kill Spidey once and for all. But this time he has his ultimate plan and zaps Spider-Man with a nullifier. Not to be confused with the ultimate nullifier, something completely different. Once hit with this device, Spider-Man loses his memory. Octavius realizes he can use this to his advantage and is able to convince Spider-Man that the two are actually partners. Basically, Octavius comes to the conclusion that Spider-Man on his side working with him is more valuable to him than just killing the webhead. But like most evil geniuses, Doc Ock's arrogance and overconfidence ultimately cost him the win. Meaning Spider-Man would come to and defeat Octavius, leaving him arrested while Spider-Man got away. After this, we have the Death Shall Come storyline, which took place in the Amazing Spider-Man issues 88 through 90. Now, this is a storyline I had to mention because in it, Dr. Octopus becomes the catalyst for the death of George Stacy. And the irony is it was an accident, but nonetheless, it happened because of Doc Ock. You see, Dr. Octopus accidentally smashed a chimney on top of a building and the debris started coming down and was about to land on top of a small child. But George Stacy pushed himself out of the way, sacrificing himself. Point is, if Green Goblin is responsible for Gwen Stacy's death, Dr. Octopus is responsible for her father, George Stacy's death accident or not. Moving along, we have another great story arc called The Web of Death. In this story, Spider-Man is basically down and out and suffering from a deadly poison. He's also having really bad emotional traumas and basically is just in a bad state both physically and mentally. And when Dr. Octopus finds out about this, he doesn't try to kick Spider-Man when he's down. No, he actually tries to help Spider-Man. It's a story that shows the other side of Dr. Octopus and a deeper relationship between Doc Ock and Spider-Man. It basically explores the fact that despite Doc Ock hating the wall crawler with every fiber in his being, he does have respect for Spider-Man 
Spider-Man being a worthy opponent, and isn't willing to see him die by something as simple as a poison. Believing that Spider-Man deserves a spectacular death, no doubt, by his hands. It's just a really cool in-depth look at the two's relationship, and it's definitely worth a read. Now with that said, let's jump to more recent years when Doc Ock would become the person he hates, Spider-Man, more specifically, the superior Spider-Man. It all went down in the Dying Wish storyline, which took place in the Amazing Spider-Man issues 698 through 700. In this storyline, we see Doc Ock is dying, literally on his deathbed because of a fatal brain tumor. But somehow on his deathbed, Dr. Octopus is able to pull off his single greatest feat, which says a heck of a lot, and that would be switching bodies with his arch nemesis, Spider-Man. Octavius literally pulled a Freaky Friday with Spider-Man, so it's all great and dandy for Otto Octavius as he's in Spider-Man slash Peter Parker's body, but Peter is now in the dying body of one of his greatest enemies. In the end, Peter dies in Octavius' body while Otto is holding him now in Spider-Man's body. Farewell, Peter Parker. Know this, I will carry on in your name. You may be leaving this world, but you are not leaving it to a villain. I swear, I will be Spider-Man. Better yet, with my unparalleled genius and boundless ambition, I'll be a better Spider-Man than you ever were. From this day forth, I shall become the superior Spider-Man. And this lasted for quite a long time. I actually really enjoyed Octavius' run as Spider-Man. But ultimately, of course, Peter Parker came back and reclaimed his body because comics. Now, after Peter's consciousness comes back to reclaim his body, Octavius' consciousness no longer has a body to reside in, so he just fades away, telling Peter, you are the superior Spider-Man. But come on, we can't not have an Otto Octavius in comics, and Marvel agrees, because it's later revealed that Otto survived by implanting his mind in the living brain. After this, Octavius transfers his consciousness into a proto-clone the Jackal had created, giving him a new, more handsome body. After this point, Otto returns to one of his old lairs, only to see that Hydra agents now reside there. But Armin Zola and Otto come to an agreement to work together to bring down Parker Industries. It's at this point the two create a new uniform and harness for Otto, and he then calls himself the Superior Octopus. Long story short, short after this without getting into the science of comic books, Octavius would return to his normal Dr. Octopus self in the green and orange we all know and love. But with that said friends, it's now time for powers and abilities. First and foremost, Dr. Octopus has a genius level intellect in the fields of atomic physics and radiation. Dude also has a PhD in nuclear science, as well as being a great inventor and engineer. As far as personality traits, he's very charismatic and a great leader, always having a plan on how to act. And as for what he's most famous for, he has a telepathic link to the four mechanical arms that are attached to his back or torso. Even when he's not wearing the harness, he maintains a telepathic link to control the arms from great distances. Each arm has piercers at the end of it, kind of like claws or insect mandibles, and each arm could extend up to 24 feet. They also have superhuman strength and enhanced reaction time. Otto can lift up to three tons with each arm, meaning if you do the math, he could lift a total of 12 tons with all of them. He also uses his arms as a method of transportation, using them to climb or walk over various terrains and rapidly at that. And of course, Otto wears an armored bodysuit because even though he's capable of delivering a superpowered beating, his body is still that of a regular human and is extremely vulnerable to injury. As the superior Spider-Man, Otto possessed all the same abilities Peter Parker had and the same gear. But but after being the Superior Spider-Man for a while, he started developing his own gear. Some would say the gear earned him the right of the Superior Spider-Man as it was a lot more high tech. But now friends, it's time for reading recommendations. First and foremost, check out The Amazing Spider-Man Issue 3, The Amazing Spider-Man Annual 1, Doc Ock Wins, A Death Shall Come, Web of Death, and The Master Planner Saga. That should be enough to get you guys started. First up for the week of October 6th, we have Batman issue 114. Batman is racing against time to stop Gotham City from tearing itself apart as the Scarecrow's long game is revealed. The Dark Knight has bigger problems though, as an insane Peacekeeper 01 is on a murderous rampage through the streets of Gotham. Can Peacekeeper X stop him? Now we have Mighty Morphin 12. Rescued by the Power Rangers, Candace reveals there's a deeper threat to Earth than previously realized. The revelation will force Zordon to grapple with his ancient past and for the sake of Earth, make a plea to a potential ally no one expects. Here we have We Have Demons issue 1. This is Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's first creator-owned series together through Comixology Originals. Which, funny enough, is the same publisher my comic Astonishing Times is published through. We Have Demons deals with the conflict between good and evil, and it's about to come to a head when a teenage hero embarks on a journey that unveils a secret society, monsters, and mayhem. And finally, we have Dark Ages Issue 2. It's been years since the age of technology ended in a single moment. It's like a switch had been flicked off for the entire planet. Now Earth's heroes attempt to bring humanity together in the darkness. X-Men and Avenger vigilantes and villains all work together to create something better. And that's gonna bring today's episode of Variant to a close, but if you like today's video check out this one right here and if you like the channel be sure to subscribe like and comment it always helps the channel grow but other than that i'll see you guys next time when i talk about all things comics